you do have a purpose. And unfortunately, that does include ALS. But you have this huge following, and my money is on you, Brooke. I believe everything happens for a reason. Maybe you and I connected to allow you to refocus and continue to make a difference in people's lives who are sick or well. I'm tearing up. Thank you. <laughs> well said. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Brooke Ebby is the fastest growing voice in the ALS community, known for her viral videos bringing humor and joy to what most consider a terrifying situation. Brooke was diagnosed with ALS at a young age and decided to actively share her journey through social media, bringing a whole new demographic of awareness to the disease. Brooke has raised a significant amount of money for ALS, but more importantly, has brought a smile to so many people's faces while doing it. She's an inspiration to so many, including myself, and we were so happy to get the chance to connect with her. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Brooke Ebby, we have a lot to talk about, but first I want to tell you how excited I am to have you join us today, so thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to meet you. You're a celebrity. This is so exciting for me. <laughs> You got kind of, you two both kind of are you. You are two of the bigger voices of ALS. This is it is cool. Yeah, it's it's like a weird microcosm of celebrity when it's because of ALS. But like Tim was celebrity prior to you know. <laughs> Brooke, before I get going, I understand from Troy that you have some questions for me. Brooke, before you ask those questions, why don't you tell the viewers or listeners that don't know who you are a little bit about yourself and and your story. Sure. So my name is Brooke Eby. I was really just a normal person up until a few years ago. So my first like 29 years of life, there's no reason anyone would have asked me to be on a podcast. I lived a very vanilla life um, in every sense. And then when I turned 29, uh, I'd been working in tech. I was living in New York City and I just started limping one day and a bunch of my coworkers noticed like when you live in New York City, you cannot limp without people noticing really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And do you guys look alike? Do you get that a lot? Boy, I hope you, you think that. Or I'm going to edit this part back in. Do, do you think we look like, alike? Um, I don't know. I mean, you both have very wide set eyes. And I'll maybe take anything. I don't know. I kind I'll of take anything I can get. I'm so bad at seeing that. Like whenever my friends are like, oh, this baby <laughs> looks so much like the mom. I'm like, I, it's a, that's a baby. I can't tell what it yeah, looks like. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way as you are. I'm like that it's, too. I'm, yeah, I'm like missing that part, but I just keep, you guys are right next to each other. So I keep going back and forth. Uh, I'll, I'll take that. I was fairly healthy otherwise. So I just assumed the limp was like, I had worked out too hard or I don't know done something dumb, like pulled a muscle or slipped a disc. Um, but it never got better. Like the limp continued to get worse over time. My calf started getting skinnier and my sister and her husband who are both doctors were like, okay, we, we got to get you into, to a doctor. Um, 
But that process for me took like four years to get a diagnosis from there. So I think it was largely denial on everyone's part because I was 29 and healthy, but I went to every type of doctor, did every type of test. The only test that came back abnormal was an EMG, but it was only abnormal in my left foot. Like every other limb was fine. And so they were like, it's not enough to give any kind of diagnosis. We just sort of have to track it with time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what those four years were, was me like putting that out of my head and then knowing I'd have to go back if anything felt worse. But nothing really changed until the beginning of 2022 when my right foot started feeling weaker too. And that's when, that's when I knew leading into that, uh, those appointments, I knew something was very wrong, but I obviously hoped it was anything but ALS. And, uh, March of 2022, they, they finally gave me the news that I officially had an ALS diagnosis. What were you thinking before? I mean, obviously you knew something was maybe the right away. You didn't think anything was wrong. And then once you're your sister got involved and you thought it maybe it's something bigger, but what were you, what were you trying to convince yourself? Or when do you think like, I guess so March 22, you really knew what were you thinking before? Yeah. Just before pre- then, I think the first couple years I thought that maybe I'd pinched a nerve and then it like caused nerve damage. Like, I think that's even what I told people was like, Oh, I have nerve damage in my foot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at one point when the EMG came back abnormal, they were like, maybe it's, something called monomelic amyotrophy, which I don't even know how I can still pronounce that, but I guess they said it so many (laughs) times that it stuck in my head. And they were like, it's most common in older Japanese men. And I'm like, okay, but I mean, maybe like I'm already an abnormal case. So like, maybe I'm just that much more (laughs) abnormal. Uh, And that's basically like ALS, but in one limb where it doesn't spread. It's just like one limb is affected and it atrophies. And everything else stays the same. So like we, ho- we thought maybe it was that, um, really, even once I got diagnosed, I kept kind of hoping it was just going to stay exactly where it was, but I'm sure everyone with ALS hopes that. And then you just sort of progress throughout your body and accept it. Has it, uh, has it been as slow moving from your initial, like your one leg thrust your body or is it? <laughs> it's hard to it's know. Hard to say, right. Yeah, there's just like no benchmark really for any of us because we're all so different. So for me, like my legs went like, I guess it was slowly because it was over the course of like five years, but they're done. Like there's nothing that works in my legs. I can kick out my right leg barely. Um, But like I stopped walking, I think six months after my diagnosis. So like the lower half of me... um, it was like a slow but severe progression, I guess. I'm making up these terms. No doctor's ever said that to me. <laughs> uh, but but then like now my upper body, I'm starting to feel some weakness. So I guess like from an ALS, like the traditional ALS trajectory, it's still technically slow. Mm-hmm. But for me, it, all, it everything's going to feel fast because I've never, you know, experienced it before. So I'm like, oh my God, like, my core is already weak. My arms are starting to feel heavy. Like how this is happening so quickly, even though it's, you know, I'm technically six years into all of this. Troy, please tell Brooke a little bit about my denial. Tell me, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when my dad, basically my dad, so he, he played in the NFL and in the NFL, he had a lot of like very serious injuries. And there's one, he knows the exact game. It was against the Patriots. I can't remember the year. He, he'll, he knows the year, but it was against the Patriots. He, he was jumping on a fumble and his elbow basically got snapped back the other way. And when they were fixing it or whatever, they're like, listen, we can do, there's two things we can do. One is we can do this short term fix, short term being like, it'll be, you know, it, you can go back in and play like next week or maybe it was even the same game. Was it the same game? No, not same game. No. Okay. So you could, so one was like, it's a short term fix and you'll be back and playing this season. But when you're older, like in 20, 30 years, your I call your ulnar nerve could get like, start to get kind of uh, smothered by the scar tissue and you'll have to have a surgery later, or you could do the surgery now, but you'll miss the rest of the season. 
And so like most, I think 20 <laughs> something year old athletes would, he's like, Oh, I'll, I'll worry about that when I'm older. Yeah. So all of a sudden one day he couldn't clip his, uh, his fingernails with a nail clipper and he couldn't figure out what it was at that time. Like him and I were lifting weights together. When I say him and I were lifting weights together, it's being very generous to what I was lifting compared to he, what he was lifting, but he looked like an action figure and he was, I mean, lifting like hundred pound dumbbells, like nothing, but his just, he couldn't clip his nails. So then he went and got an ulnar nerve surgery. So he got surgery on his right arm thinking that was it. And initially things looked worse, not better. And the doctor's like, Oh, it could take a camera. It was 12 weeks before that really that nerve starts like coming back to life. And then he's like, well, now I can't do it with my left arm either. So they looked at his left arm and they saw there was a lot of scar tissue in that arm too. So um, he got surgery on that arm and then he actually, um, he's like, something's not right here. He had a cast on and he's like, something's not right. My mom is like the, my mom's hilarious. She's like, Tim, leave your, leave your cast alone, you know? And he took, he took a knife, literally a kitchen knife and cut his own cast off because he's like, something's not right here. Oh my God. And, and he's, you know, he's a lunatic, but so he's, uh, anyways, I'll fast forward a little bit, but so we end up. Uh, something's still wrong. He goes and sees a doctor. And the first doctor he saw was actually like pretty brutal. It's, it's frustrating for me to even talk about, but he was, the doctor's like, Hey, here's the deal. Um, you got ALS, you got probably six months to live. Like you should put your, get your will, get your affairs in order. And him and my mom, I wasn't there for that. They rode back from New York city to, to back to upstate. And it was just like silence in the car. And he, he like told us, but not really. Like he, yeah. he told, like sat down me and my uh, older siblings and kind of said what was going on. But he's like, look, I don't want to hear the letters A, L, or S together in a sentence. Like we're not talking about it. It's not here. We didn't know he's not going to, because of the experience thing with the doctor and he could talk better about this, but the doctor thing was pretty like traumatic, obviously. And um, he has a story too. When he was younger, he saw like a young kid, he, he saw like ALS and, and muscle dystrophy. And was like, wow, that's a really scary thing. So he was like the whole time in his head, hoping, man, I hope that that's not what it is kind of situation. So I also had the bones in my thumb fused together. Oh yeah. Yeah. We also, then they thought it was his thumb had a ligament that was torn in it from football. Yeah. So they fused his thumb. So yeah, like we, we were trying anything. They like, thought about, they were like, should we fuse your ankle because of my foot drop? And they were like, it's nothing else. So we might as well do it. And my sister was like, nope, you, no, absolutely not. You're not doing that. And now I'm glad yeah. it would have been just one extra surgery that wouldn't have helped. But I guess that's yeah. like, I guess we all kind of go on the same trajectory of like denial paths of trying to assume it's anything else. Cause yeah, the fusing, it was, that's hardcore. It, it was, yeah. yeah, it was hardcore. And even still, like when he, when he was diagnosed and then it was like very clear, he like other things started to slip and he clearly had ALS. Yeah. Um, he still didn't tell anyone. wouldn't say anything like, but if people asked, he'd be like, Oh, you know, just like he started to lose his voice a little bit. He's like, Oh yeah, my voice, just a thing. And then uh, my mom and I started kind of planning in the background of getting him to see Dr. Marisakovich, who I know was a friend of yours and she's just the best. The best. And my dad still wouldn't go uh, until the, the, how he convinced him actually, like I said, I'm like, look, you have some notoriety. You have like, you've got the books, the NFL, the TV stuff, the law stuff. Like people, you're, don't do it for you. Do it for the next person who doesn't have a voice, doesn't have any kind of platform, doesn't have the ability to, to, to get on 60 minutes or any of that stuff. Yeah. And then he finally agreed to do it. We went, we met with Merritt and we shot a thing with 60 minutes. And anyway, so yeah, the first year, man, it was when I denials an understatement. I mean, we couldn't even acknowledge it. And he's, he, but dad, you, I mean, you knew you just didn't want to know basically. Right. I think yeah. the denial helps. Like I'm still in denial of everything that's going to come after today. Like mm -hmm. I'm still in denial that like, you know, my arm, my, I won't be able to move my hand like this, even though like, that's what this disease does. I think it's, I would lose my mind. I think if I started thinking about the next thing as opposed to just like assuming life's going to carry on this way. Like yeah. I, I think denial and Zoloft are like my go-tos whenever I'm having that day. 
my dad always says, and dad, I might be, I might be taking the words out of your mouth, but my dad always says like, focus on what we, what you can do and what you have, not what yeah. you can't do and what you don't have. So I would yeah. say to, I'm from the cheap seats. You guys are really in the shoulder to shoulder in the trenches here. But I would say my two cents to you is like, I would keep that mentality. Like, don't, it's not a bad thing. Enjoy, enjoy it all. Like, don't, don't think about what might come and what might be next. Like just enjoy everything while you have it. Yeah. Well, so, so Brooke, how do you go from diagnose that journey to, you know, a hundred thousand followers on Instagram and almost 200,000, I think on TikTok. And what made you decide to kind of, I guess, put your, put yourself out there like that? Cause it is a very intimate thing, ALS and, and that journey. Yeah. Um, I should have added delusion to that list of denial and Zoloft because delusion, I think, helps a lot, too. Uh, so hopefully you haven't heard the wedding story too many times that you'll roll your eyes. But I got diagnosed in March and in May, I was a bridesmaid at my friend's wedding, like one of my best friends from college. Mm -hmm. So it was like kind of a college reunion and people were like dieting for this wedding. They were getting spray tans. Like it was one of those weddings where everyone wanted to look good because it was, you know, however far we 14 years since graduating college, we all wanted to look good. And, uh, I was showing up having spent the prior two months eating M&Ms in bed. <laughs> so like, I was just not not feeling great. Uh, my bridesmaid's dress was a little tight. I was using a walker that was the same walker that the bride's grandma was using. <laughs> <laughs> we walked in and I was like, she's got the same tennis balls I've got. Um, and so I was just like, this is going to be the worst night ever. Like, I don't want to be here. And as, as we were walking in, I think it really hit me like how embarrassing this was going to be because I hadn't really left the house. I'd only seen my closest friends and family. Um, and now I'm going on basically a stage with this walker. Clearly something's wrong. And I just had no idea how to deal with it. So we're walking into the wedding and I turned to my best friend and I'm like, let's just leave. Like, I don't, let's just leave. No one's even going to notice if one bridesmaid is missing. It's going to be way too embarrassing. Like I, I get an out for this. Right. And she was like, Brooke, like, it could be really embarrassing or we could just make it really fun. Like either way, you're going to get a really good story out of it. So let's just go in and try to have fun. And that's kind of always been our motto is like, at least you'll get a story out of it. Like we say that about everything, that. bad dates, bad jobs. Like you always end up at least with a good story. So I, I finally like slowly walked into the wedding, limped my way into the wedding and a few hours later, like once the dancing portion started, we, I get, I don't know what happened, but like something just flipped where all of a sudden, like the bride was limboing under my walker. Like my best friend was sitting on my walker and I was dancing across, like giving her walker rides all over the dance floor. The cameramen at that wedding were like all over us. Cause they were like, this is hilarious. And I guess, I don't know. I think my friend's words just sort of stuck in my head. Like just try to make it fun do whatever you can to make it fun. Even if inside you're deeply uncomfortable, just try to make it fun. And it was like kind of a fake it till you make it moment where all of a sudden I was having fun. And so after that, I'm like, okay, everyone was laughing. No one felt uncomfortable asking me questions. We were all just like enjoying ourselves and it made people like, I, I was more approachable with ALS because I was having fun and so after that, I would, I decided to really start sharing with more people. So many funny things had happened to me since being diagnosed, like people saying the wrong things. Cause like none of us knows what to say, weird sure. experiences I had had. And I, I just found so much humor in it all of a sudden. And so I started posting, it kind of took off from there. I don't really know what happened, but TikTok is a weird place. Like if you, if you capture people's attention in the first like 10 seconds of talking, you kind of have them and TikTok will just start sending it to more and more people. So I just started running with it. And, and then, you know, some like news publications picked it up and I got to go on the today show. And I think that really helped boost my audience. Uh, 
and now I I don't know what I'm doing still. Like I'm just posting about my life and I, I'm like, we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. So I'm just going to make a video about it each day and see what happens. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Okay. So now yeah, that no strategy involved at all. It seems like there's strategy because it's gone. Like it's, it's, it's the trajectory is just awesome. But yeah. So we're, we're, we kind of heard about you through, so I heard your name from our friend Merit, uh, Dr. Merit Yeah. But then all of a sudden, like, People started saying like, "Hey," because people know we're involved with ALS. And they're like, "Hey, you got to see Brooke. You got to see Brooke." And and uh, anyways, then my wife was like, "Troy, there's this there's this girl Brooke. She is just the best, and she has ALS. And she's showing me like we're watching. I mean, we we must have gone through like I don't even know twenty videos. She's like just the next, the next. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So anyways, so now that people who anyone listening or watching who didn't know know a little bit about you now. Dad, I stole your thunder. Let's go back to you wanted the, I know. the question. <laughs> Dad, we've been gabbing away. Um, okay, so I have some questions and I realized I wrote the first three and you could kind of tell the headspace I was in that day when I wrote them because the first two were like pretty negative. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, I got to do a, a fun one at, at the end there. But um, okay, so my first one was, how did you overcome the last bad moment that you had? And for context, I had a fall like two months ago that gave me a really bad black eye. And I feel like it took me like a few weeks to feel normal again. So I just wanted to hear your perspective on how you overcame it. The last bad moment I had was in the hospital in January. I had this infection in my saliva gland because of the glycopyrrolate I have to take to keep from drooling all over myself. Anyways, I was in the ICU and the infection had swollen up the side of my face and neck. It was ugly. Well, this doctor says they have to squeeze my neck and force the goo out of my neck while they squeeze my face to force the goo back through the saliva duct and purging it through my mouth. Now, I've experienced lots of pain in my day, but this was special. Anyway, I always say that the NFL was the best preparation for ALS money can buy. You have to swim in pain. You must endure deprivation, humiliation, and eat a steady diet of humble pie. So anytime I have a bad moment, I lean into my eight years in the NFL. I need to know everything about this. (laughs) I got to give you a little... Troy, were you there? So I I wasn't... I bet it was like... Okay, I'm sure it was very painful, but I bet it was really satisfying to watch. <laughs> like I'm picturing it like a big pimple pop, no? It was it was pretty gruesome. They had let me I'll, I'll give a little context. So for anybody who doesn't know, so so uh glyco, he said the more fancy name for it. I only know the abbreviated version of glyco is something that um he takes and it helps reduce saliva since he has the trach, it's you can't really swallow. So to stop the saying, like, stop <laughs> drooling, uh, he takes this thing, glyco. So something in it got infected in his saliva glands. So all of a sudden, like on his neck, he had like it's all his neck and like side of his face started to kind of bulge out a little bit because it got infected. And they were they were pushing on the spot. But they also, yeah, I mean, it was it was painful. No, no, keep going, keep going. <laughs> That's disgusting, by the way. It was disgusting. It was so, like it was like pus was coming out of your mouth yeah but they had it so they had they were they had something somebody was in his mouth say his mouth open and somebody was in his mouth like getting it out but somebody was pushing on his neck to get it to come yeah it was it was really oh my god yeah you asked and this was like out of nowhere knock on wood we haven't had well I'm, i'm sure my dad um we haven't had any big stuff like that in a long time, but you asked, what was your last, uh, you know, last bad day at a bad time? <laughs> That's insane. I like, I want to see it on video, but I like, I, it would make me, I'm sure feel really like bad, <laughs> but it just, I'm fascinated. I also watch like a lot of pimple popping videos. So I think I just am sick. <laughs> I think I'm a sicko. You and, uh, it's funny cause you, and well, like, we could go down, this could lead us down a rabbit hole, but like you and my dad, your approach to ALS, but it seems like most things, you kind of put humor on everything. 
It's all I got. Right. It's all I have. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm I'm more down your your lane, but he's telling the story about his like gruesome pain, and you and I were sitting there laughing and smiling. <laughs> I know, I'm like, Did you get a video? I want to see it. <laughs> no, I I'm so like I was the youngest. It sounds like you are the youngest. I'm in the middle. Oh, you're in the middle. Okay, there's a lot of you, huh? Yeah, five. There's like a whole team. Yeah. Um. So I'm the youngest of three, and my siblings are significantly older than I am, six and eight years. Mm-hmm. And so, like, the only way I could even get involved in their conversations was by making a joke. That was, like, my only thing. And so I think that's, like, just how my brain is programmed is, like, I have to find the joke in whatever I'm doing, which, yeah. you know, I guess, like, even terminal illnesses are not exempt from that because I'm still trying to do that each day. But, man... I'm, I'm, I can like kind of feel my mouth watering now, like thinking about someone pushing on here. <laughs> like it kind of hurts. <laughs> it happened in a day. That's why they were worried. It, it happened in a day, which is why they were worried. So, oh, it swelled so. up that big in a day. I'm surprised they couldn't just like put a needle in from the outside. So that's what we said too. And the reason why they couldn't is because it was a it was a long thin infection. It wasn't like a spot oh. because it was like in his neck where it was like by all like arteries and stuff. If they had tried to drain it like that, like, there was like a higher risk. Oh my god! So they're yeah. like, so it's like in your mouth. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That probably still haunts your dreams. Like you're never going to go to the dentist again. There, no one's allowed <laughs> to go inside your mouth. It was far from thin. I was far from thin in his neck, but it was thin as from, from the cheap seats. I could say it was thin. The doctor said it was too thin. It was thin enough. I'll say this. It was not thin. It was thin enough that they were nervous about going into the needle to try and drain it. But I, I know he doesn't want me to to downplay. He's not losing any, any street cred over this. It wasn't, it wasn't a small. You're like, it was just a tiny sliver. He's like, you're so small. (laughs) God, that sounds painful. Whenever I see it, the smirk, Brooke, I know he's got some comment, some side jab at me coming here, I think. You gotta, like mentally prep yourself to be taken <laughs> yeah. down a notch. Meanwhile, you, you were kicked back in Florida on the beach. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I was in Florida while he was, well, oh, this I was happening. I'm like, wait, this might have been for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I called him and I'm like, dude, do you need me to come back there? Like, can I help? And he's like, no, no. How long has he had the trach? I've had the trach for four or five years. Just for whatever it's worth. I don't know if you're asking because you're you're curious, but we were my dad was like very nervous about getting the trach. And then after we did it, we we talked about like the trach and the, the peg tooth. Or he's like, I wish we kind of did it a month or two sooner than we did. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason the feeding tube doesn't scare me, but the trach does. I think like just the concept of needing to be like hooked up all the time is what's scary. It's like, there's so many more things to think about. Like if the power goes out, what do you do? Like all those little things are just, it's so much more to think about. Um, but I also understand the concept of like wanting more time, especially when you have, you know, kids and grandkids. Um, sounds kind of morbid, but like, I don't have, kids i have nieces and nephews so sometimes i'm like unsure about my decision with the trach um but i think they said to think about it every six months because it'll change every six months so that's kind of where i've been at yeah i think it's uh it's such a like hyper personalized decision so it's, it's, everyone's got to make their own, like, I don't, I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to <laughs> pitch you on or whatever. You're selling, but, you're selling me on the train. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm selling you on it, but it's like, there's, there's memories and experiences and fun things that right. we've done since he's had the trach that are like, I couldn't imagine. Again, I don't, I don't want to sound yeah, like, no, a, no. But it's, it's so everyone's got to do what's best for them. But I, I, you are so like, even with ALS, you're so full and, and you and I have known each other for all of whatever, 45 minutes, but you're like so full of like fun and joy and life that it's, and I, I also too have a personal opinion that I think ALS is, is cured in like, 
or maybe it's not cured, it becomes like livable where they can, they can find something that, um, lets people like rege- repair and regeneration kind of stuff Yeah. that, and I think that's like imminent based on stuff that I've heard. Knock on wood. Heard. Everyone knock on wood. Yeah. So that's why I'm like, I, you, you have to, do, I, I want to say to you, you have to do it, but you have to do whatever you, you Yeah. Can. No, it's, I was talking to a psychiatrist and the story of how I met him is comical, but might not have time for it today. But I was like, yeah, I just like with all these machines, they want you to decide, you know, and then review and then decide and then review constantly. And like, I just feel like it's far away. Like I, I don't, you know, like thinking about it. Um, but like, I don't know that I'd want to be attached to a machine. And he was like, he, he said something that I feel like had a lot of meanings, but it was like kind of a Yoda thing. He said, you don't know the machine yet. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to sit on that one. Cause that feels like <laughs> really heavy sentiment, but I, like, I think it kind of is like a very meaningful sentence in so many ways. Cause it's like, I don't know what I'll be like at that point. Like, it's basically just like, don't, yeah. don't make decisions about your future self that, yeah. you know, without having the ability to change them. Um, but I hear him saying that in my head all the time. Like, you don't know the machine yet. It seems so like ominous, like uh, some kind of sci-fi yeah. movie. <laughs> you kind of too, like in a way, I can't remember who said this, but I think it was like an Elon Musk thing, but somebody I heard say, this is not, I'm not that smart to come up with this. They said like, we kind of already are cyborgs. Like we have everyone just, we're like, everyone just walks around with their phone, like in yeah. their pocket, in their hand, in their hip, they're looking That's at it. True. So it's like, what the heck's the difference? Like adding a second machine to the rotation, who cares? Kind of. But, That's so true. I've never thought about it like that. You're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came up with that. <laughs> That'll be on my, on my tombstone. Yeah. Someone asked me once, what do you want written on your tombstone? That's a really hard question to answer. I was like, I have no idea. Like I'm donating my body to science, so I don't think I'm going to have it. <laughs> but that's, I think I should have added that to the list of questions just so I could have copied Tim's answer in the future. I'm excited to hear his answer to my next question because I want to hear both of your answers. Before we get to that, you are a long way off from a trach. You might beat the clock. I hope so. It's like... Some days I feel that way. And then other days I'm like, I understand why they tell you two to five years because like things break down quickly with this disease. It's like, you're just constantly accepting the next change. It's just rapid acceptance all the time. Like, I'll be like, Oh, I'm fine. Like my breathing's fine. Um, and then, you know, a week later I'm like, now my arm feels heavy. Like it's always something. So (laughs) The two to five years there, I'm like, that makes sense. Like we are unicorns to have, have, having made it past that. I mean, Tim, especially like you're what, 10 years in, nine, nine years in. Yeah. Eight years in. Eight. Um, and I don't know what I'm considered because I'm diagnosed two years symptoms for six, but it's like, we are, we are already like the 1% or 10% of the disease that makes it past the two to five years. And I can, I feel it. Like I feel, I'm like, wow, this disease, if I'm a slow progressor, I can't imagine what it feels like to be a fast one. Yeah. But you are, I think, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, this sounds like I'm just trying to be like complimentary, but you are like, and you are in very, for how long you've had it. Cause if you had symptoms for six years before being diagnosed, I mean, you probably, it'd probably be safe to say you've had it for whatever, six years plus two is eight. You know, no, no. Eight years. I had it four years oh, before four that. Years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four years, yeah. So probably safe to say six years. I mean, that's, you are in, un, for, for six years, you're in unble- an unbelievable spot. So Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm at the point where I'm like losing independence, but I can still fake independence a little bit. Like I still live alone, but like, mm-hmm. I'm starting to need more and more help. Like every time someone comes over, I'm like, also, can you take out the trash? Also, can you do that? Like, I just leave them lists of just, it's like fake independence, but it's working for me so far. That's great. All right, let's do, cause I, I want to hear these responses too. Let's go to question number two. Okay. 
And this one, I feel like is more uh, representative of my mental state than anyone else's. But how do you stay sane? The only time I felt insane was when I was diagnosed. The doctor told me to get my affairs in order because I only had one to three years to live. I was terminal and there was nothing to be done for me. I lost my mind. Now, I'm a high-strung person as it is, but this was my worst nightmare. This haunted me ever since I was a kid. Watching those fundraisers for muscular dystrophy, I would panic whenever that show came on, but felt compelled to watch. Anyways, I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. And I was such a wreck that I started to get suicidal thoughts. My wife, Alyssa, says, you better go see Paul, our doctor, and one of my best friends. He sees me and sends me right to a shrink to get medicine for anxiety. It took me two weeks to start feeling better. Yeah, it was kind of a better recap of what I was saying earlier. <laughs> but yeah, when he first got diagnosed, it was like I said, it was, it was rough. Yeah. I feel like those doctors hopefully have learned to not do that. Yeah. But I'm sure there are still, I mean, the one that first brought up ALS to me, it was two years into that four year period was like, you know, we think you might have ALS. We're going to give you genetic testing. And I was like, what's that now? I was like 30 years old. And then they gave me the genetic testing and sent me home. And then four weeks later, the genetic test came back clear. And so I thought I didn't have it. And we celebrated. Like, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of bedside manner that yeah. needs to be used around ALS. Cause nobody knows about it until you've had to live close to it. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing and we, we've said this before, but the only thing I'd ever heard about ALS was, uh, the ice bucket challenge. Yeah. And, um, there's a football player who plays the New Orleans saints. And, uh, my dad played for the Atlanta Falcons and those teams play each other twice a year. And there's a guy his name is Steve Gleason. If you don't know him, you should look him up. He's awesome. Yeah. But... Everyone knows Steve Gleason. Okay. Yeah. He's so Steve, lab. so I would see Steve at the, at the game I, before my dad had anything. And we, I didn't know anything about ALS. I would just see, they'd show Steve at the games and talk about it. So that was the only two things I had about ALS until August, 2016. Yeah. Did they play? Did you guys play against each other? No, he was Steve's younger than my dad. That? Yeah, no. Oh. That would have been really cool. Yeah. He's still so, like going to Mardi Gras. He's yeah. not. <laughs> Brooke, is there things that are there things that you do that you feel like help keep you sane? Or again, it's very individual. Mental health and ALS stuff are both very super individualized. But is there other things that you do that you feel like help you a lot? Um I think like seeing friends and family is the thing that keeps me the most sane. Like every time I'm alone for long periods, there's like, you start thinking a little too much. I just like get sick of my own voice a little bit. Um, and so that usually like breaks me out of any kind of bad cycle I'm having. But, but like in terms of sanity, it is weird with ALS because like part of me gets a case of like, the efforts where I'm like, whatever, like the worst things already happened. So like, who cares about anything? Like, I think there's a, a path you can go down of like, cares be damned. And I try to not do that too hard because like, you need to stay in reality a little bit, you know? So I, I staying sane is interesting because I'm like, part of me feels like I'm living my funeral every day, the way I'm like always talking about ALS, the way people are always like, you know, get, telling me like the greatest things I've ever done. Like it sort of feels like a funeral all the time. Yeah. And so that's actually why I still work because I think it's like the place where I feel like I still feel like a minion every day, just doing my job. And I think that kind of helps keep me in reality a little bit. That's, how about anything other than family, friends, or anything particularly fun you like to do or anything that's like, um, I'm a big reader. That's like when I can tell I'm not doing well is if I've like this year, I've read 11 books already. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I might not be doing so good. Like if that, because it's just like escapism for me. Um, and 
yeah, beyond that, I think just like being social helps me. And then the social yeah. media side has actually helped uh, quite a bit because it's just like sort of desensitized me to a lot of it. I'm able to talk about yeah. all of this a lot easier than I was before I started doing it on a big scale. Cool. All right, let's go to the next question you had. Um, okay, and that, these are all kind of sad until the last one. I'm sorry, but uh, do you ever think about what life would have been like without ALS? Because I think about this. This is like probably my most negative trait is that I think about that. I never think about it. You said something in one of your posts that applies. You said you had a purpose, and that was to make people in our situation laugh. I think you may have lost or forgotten your purpose. My Christian faith has had a big impact on my life, especially since my diagnosis. I recommend it for you and everyone who is searching for that purpose, because you are right. You do have a purpose, and unfortunately, that does include ALS. But you have this huge following, and my money is on you, Brooke. I believe everything happens for a reason. Maybe you and I connected to allow you to refocus and continue to make a difference in people's lives who are sick or well. I'm tearing up. Thank you. <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah, you're, I mean, like I said, uh, Brooke earlier, I mean, I've, I've heard about you from, so many different people like you are, I, I'm sure, you know, and you see it on social media, but maybe it's a little um, desensitized because it is on social media. I mean, you have healthy people, sick people. There's so many people that, that like your post for the day or your post for the week or your reel or TikTok or whatever it is, like changes people's whole days. My mom always says she like, she laughs so hard looking at the comments through my post. Cause I'll be like, I'll like tie my shoe. And people are like, you're amazing. You're the inspiration of my day. I wake up to see your man. She's like, you weren't even doing anything. That for you. <laughs> like, I feel like my friends and family keep me, keep me humble with that stuff. But um, yeah, the purpose thing I think is like the North star. Like that's all I have to go back to every time my brain starts going into like what would I be doing right now? If you know, would I be traveling more? Would I be doing X, Y, and Z? And it's like, I, I wouldn't be helping if I were in that position, you know, I wouldn't be, uh, leading a fulfilling life. I don't think so. The purpose thing helps. Yeah. And, and ALS is such like an underrepresented group that it's your, you're one voice, but you're speaking for like, I, again, I'm not just saying this because you're here. You are one of the biggest voices right now in ALS. And I think the most to me, again, I, this is all like you said earlier, you're not, a, not a doctor. This is all Troyism. It's all made up. But yeah. my opinion, don't, no one, no one uh, re rely on these sort of as a course, but you're, I think that you've brought in a totally different audience to ALS because I think ALS is it's mostly older people, right? And then it's a lot of people who. Oh, your dad didn't like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, then you have like the, then you have like the Steve Gleasons and my dad yeah. and people like a lot of athletes, like head collision type stuff. You're a totally like you're an anomaly in a in a yeah. way that I'm sure you wish you weren't. But you also are bringing so many. You're bringing like younger people to ALS because I would you know. Again, I don't, I don't know anybody who knows anything about ALS unless it's touched somebody in their family. And I think you're, I think you're changing that. I think people are going to see it and know what it is. And if you, ins you might inspire the next, you know, Marissa Kovic, right? Or you might inspire the next Steve Gleason or whoever it is, like on yeah. both sides. So people who get diagnosed and people who don't. So yeah, I think you're, I think, I think you probably know, but, I, but, I'll say it anyways, your post, like your, your voice is just so important for the whole, the whole field. Thank you. I think like a lot of the timing worked out perfectly for me too. Like that's why when, when you say like everything happens for a reason, the timing of all of this for me has been crazy. So my symptoms started in 2018. They started getting bad, uh, 
in 2020, then COVID hits and I get to work from home. So it was like, I never really had to go through severe symptoms while trying to balance commuting to work in New York city and going back and forth. So I was, um, able to spend more time with family during COVID as the symptoms were getting worse. I could start going to more and more doctor's appointments. Uh, and then TikTok blew up and then I didn't lose my voice, knock on wood. And I'm like, okay, a lot of these things are kind of coming. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm in the right, right time, right position for all of this. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of, and I'm delusional enough to put my face on the internet and not care. <laughs> Like my sister's always like, aren't you uncomfortable knowing that people are just like seeing your face all the time? I'm like, I never even thought about it. Like it just, uh, it never occurred to me. Um, again, I'm the youngest child. So I think like attention is my love language. And so I think like all these things kind of came together where I was like, let's see if people are interested in this. And at, at first I think it was a lot of people who, had some sort of connection to ALS. It was, you know, kids or family members or friends. And then I think, you know, because TikTok is so randomized, it started bringing in people who had never heard of ALS or thought it had a cure because of the ice bucket challenge. And so I think like those social media platforms have just been a way to get a message out there. And I've just tried to like sell the message a little bit. My last question is fun. I promise I won't cry. <laughs> I'm an easy crier. I should have warned you guys at the beginning of this, but. I believe ALS is a second chance at life for me to live closer to God. I've never thought of it as a second chance, but that's a beautiful way to look at it. Have you written the book since being diagnosed or were they all prior to? Yeah, he's written uh, actually his high as most ever. So he's had a couple of books that are on the New York Times bestseller. They were like number, I'm going to butcher this too. And he'll not like, he won't like it, but like, I, think higher like, than you. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like number four and number seven. So they're like really high up there. He, he wrote this book called Final Season, which actually hit number one on the New York Times bestselling, uh, bestselling uh, bestsellers. And it's actually, I'm going to recommend, I'm going to do a shameless a shameless plug here, dad, for your book. But Brooke, I think you, if you're a reader and, and yeah. you are, I think you'd like it's, it. The book is geared towards like middle aged readers, but um, I've had a lot of adults what do you reach read? these days. I don't even know what. Yeah, like, I guess it's like five. Is that count? I guess middle aged. I should have should have clarified like middle like teen like teen readers like middle school high school. Oh, oh okay. It's middle grade novels, not middle age. Middle grade. Okay. Okay. He had this uh, final season, which is a middle grade book, but. Um, it's a lot. I've had a lot of adults or, or, you know, whatever high school people have reached out to me about it because the story it's called final season and it's based. I don't know if this is out there and I think it's out there. Maybe I'm spoiling. Maybe it's a spoiler, but the book's been out long enough. It's kind of based loosely on, uh, my, on our family because my younger brother who's a lot younger than, uh, than myself, but he, he was playing football still. And my dad was, like diagnosed ALS and it was from football and all that stuff. So my mom was like, he is not playing football. He is not, like, he's done. And my dad, my dad wasn't saying, yes, he is playing football. My dad was saying, if he wants to play football, he should play. Like, we're not letting this, we're not letting my diagnosis be something that stops him. Mm -hmm. And then I was on my mom's side. My older brother was on my dad's side. And the compromise was we all are like, sitting around our, their, my parents' dinner table. And the compromise was that my younger brother would play one more season. My dad would be the head coach. I would coach the offense. My brother Thane would coach the defense. And my little brother Ty, he would only play offense. And so final season is, there's some stories in there too that are um, like pretty, you know, just, just made up for entertainment. But a lot of it is really like a three year or two year of my dad's like ALS starting to then like him being at the end of the book, he's in a wheelchair, which really it, it was a slower progression than that for my dad. But he kind of crammed that all into and it's like real arguments and real conversations. And he makes the has the the character in the book who played in the NFL, the dad in the book who played in the NFL starts losing his voice. Um, and then like puts that into the book. So it's, it is, uh, 
I, I would recommend it. I'll say that. Shameless. Yeah, plug. I need to read it. All right, let's do the uh, let's do the the fun question now that we got the tough ones out of the way. Okay, no more tears. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you guys are each going to have multiple stories for this, so I'm I'm excited. But what's the funniest moment that ALS has brought you? One of the funniest moments was down on our dock. Timmy Williams, my wrestling coach's son, pulled up in his boat to say hi and had his little preschool daughter with him. His daughter started asking questions about me. Daddy, why can't he talk? Daddy, why can't he move? Daddy, why does his chair have wheels? Daddy, what's the tube for? And with, with each question, Timmy's face is getting a deeper shade of red. Meanwhile, I'm laughing harder and harder silently. Then I start to laugh so hard I'm crying. And he just keeps getting more and more uncomfortable by the second. <laughs> I love when kids react. Like, I think kids have the most genuine response to it all because, like, they're just curious. They're not like, it's not good or bad. But I swear the adults are always like, stop asking the questions. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah. He's, I have like my, my kids will sometimes ask questions. I guess me and my, my uh, nieces and nephews, they'll ask questions that are pretty funny. One of the, one of the funnier things too is like, uh, with my dad, it's like, I'll tell my kids no. And he'll tell, he said, the joke is, and it's not really a joke. It's a fact. He says yes to literally anything they ask for. And so they're just starting to realize the power of that. Yeah. So they'll, they'll be like, Oh, can we have ice cream? And I'm like, no way guys. No way. You guys haven't, you haven't eaten one bite of dinner. And then they'll go like whisper to my dad and I'll see them go to the freezer and like come out with, like a carton of ice cream. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Whoa, whoa what are you doing? Like pop said, yes. How they call him pop. They're like pop said yes. And I'm like, I look at my dad. I'm like, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he just goes, <laughs> he's like, oh, that's so sweet. He said, he's like, it's not my job. It's not my job to say no anymore. With the that's grandkids. true. So he just he'll go watch. Actually, this is a this is a good uh, this is a good story. My my daughter. So I have a daughter now who's she's four, almost five. And her and my, she, she watches, like we try to not let her watch a lot, like do a lot of screen time stuff, whatever, except for when she's with my dad, like they can go crazy. And so she was watching, I think it was Mickey Mouse Clubhouse with my dad. Yeah. And they were watching and watching and watching me and, and, and whatever. It's a couple episodes in. I'm like, all right, like we got to go. Like we're going to bed, whatever. And she's like, thanks, Pop, for letting me watch. Thanks for watching with me. You know, like it's like a fun thing together. You know, thanks so much. And then, <laughs> then uh, we were leaving and my dad watches on, on the tablet. So like she lays on his lap and they watch together. So I pick that up and we're leaving. And my dad was trying to close out of it, but accidentally played it. So it started playing again. And she was like so betrayed. She looked at me. She goes, oh, Dad. Pop is watching without me. He was supposed to save our spot. <laughs> she was so, she was so betrayed. Yeah, it was great. Maybe he was secretly trying to watch. It. Yeah, that's so. Then that's the running joke is like we'll put on, we'll put on like uh, you know, whatever. He'll be watching with them, and then we'll always be like, oh, does are they watching or is he watching? Yeah. It, like. He'll like close his eyes and take a nap while they're watching or whatever. But yeah, that's funny. So what is this Korea story? That's where I thought he was going to go. We we had, there's actually, there's a, there's a good, uh, Korea story was he, he, we went over to get the, they took stem cells out of like his bone marrow. So they had to take, they had to like break into his hip. And, and this is probably a little morbid for the podcast, but they had to, to get to your bone marrow, they have to like break your hip bone and then like extract it out. And the, my dad is the biggest patient they'd ever had by like a hundred pounds. Like they all couldn't believe, like when we walked in, they're like, Oh my gosh, he's so big. He's like a movie star. He's a big American movie star guy. So and that, that was hilarious and it's in its own right. But, um, while they were, so like he was laying on his side facing me. And they were behind him, like doing this, doing this procedure. And they'd given him stuff to, you know, numb him and all that. And so he could just see me, but I could see him and what was going on behind him. And it was just like craziness. I mean, craziness, craziness. And you were, so he, you were awake when they broke your hip. 
Yeah, they had. To, it wasn't like breaking it. They had to like. I mean, they had to get. I guess breaking it. He. They had to get like this really big like needle type instrument into his hand, uh, and he had to get into the bone. Oh so there. <laughs> you like the pus, but you don't like that one. Uh, yeah, no, I, I still <laughs> like hearing it, but I'm gonna react. So, so my uh, my dad's looking at me, and like his body's moving, right? Because he, but he's he's numb, so he can't feel it. But his body's moving, which he can feel that because there's the person who was trying to do it couldn't they couldn't break through because he was too big. Oh. So they have two people who are like, you know, and and he's looking at me, and he and he goes. Hey, uh, what? Cause he, he, he didn't have a trach at this point. He's like, Hey, is everything, everything good? And I'm sitting there looking and I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. No, everything looks normal to me. It's like barbaric. But and, they were like, and they were like trying to, they're like, they're like, shh, shh, but they're like totally panicked. They're like, totally. They have no, you know, they're like in total uncharted waters. And he's like, he's like, he's like, uh, you, you're, you're sure everything's good. I'm like, yeah, no, no, it's all good. You know? And the, <laughs> Oh I, my uh, God. Did that help at all? You know, it's tough to say because I guess, uh, yeah. he is such a slow, he had a slow progressing version, but I don't know. It was definitely traumatic. Oh my God. <laughs> Them shushing you is the best. Tell her about the blood. I know. I wasn't sure I should say that on the, on the podcast, but I, we can go into that. So they finally, they finally break through and blood <laughs> sp- like sprayed out. And it looked like it sounds, it sounds like, uh, if it's very morbid for a podcast, but it looked, I mean, it looked like a cartoon. Like it was just like, psh. and then he's like, so he's like, and so everything's fine. I'm like, yeah, no, everything's fine. I'm like, probably pale white. I'm like, everything's fine. Yeah, it looks good. And then, uh, when it was all done, you know, he was fine. Whatever they, they did, they got the bone marrow. And then he, uh, tipped back onto his back and he, he had to sit up. Like he had to sit in like a specific position and he sits up and he saw like there was like blood on the floor. They were cleaning up and he's like, what the hell happened? Like, what, what was that? <laughs> so, that was really oh good. Oh my one. God. That's crazy. That's like something out of a house episode. Yeah. That was, and then that, that whole process though, like we were, the time change was so different. It was basically like, I say to people, it felt like him and I went to like college together. Like, cause we were just in this, we were in like this hospital room it was like a dorm almost. I had like a bedroom and a hospital room attached to it, like a living room. And so I was sleeping in the bedroom. He would sleep in the, the room, they did the procedures. And then like during the day, we'd hang out in the living room together. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was the, that whole thing it was just a riot. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. They probably still tell that story to this day. A hundred percent. Like, Don't worry. We've done NFL players. Yeah. <laughs> And like the blankets that they had, they couldn't, they, they weren't long enough to cover either of our whole bodies. We're not like so tall. I'm, I'm like six foot and he's like six two. And so we had to have like multiple blankets on us. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, so there giants there. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. My turn to ask questions now. And my questions came from your posts on Instagram, which I found hilarious. So disclaimer. I am going to ask some questions that I would not normally ask. What is the status with your boyfriend? And if he's out of the picture, where are you at with dating? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. He, he's still in the picture. Um, but it's, it's a very different relationship than prior to ALS dating was. Like we really don't think about the future that much which I think can be like confusing to people who are on a normal trajectory of like planning for kids, planning for marriage, planning for all this stuff. Like I'm really not planning for any of those. Um, and so at this point we're all just kind of like enjoying each other's company and enjoying every day. But, um, yeah, I dating with a, a terminal diagnosis is bizarre. Like when I got diagnosed, I was single. Um, and that was like a comical experiment, me trying to navigate first dates and dating apps and all of this, um, while, you know, while fighting ALS on the side. And so it's, I think that those were some of my first like very viral videos on TikTok was 
explaining like how I would approach it and like jokes I would tell to try to lighten the mood because there's like literally no handbook when it comes to that. And hopefully like some of my experiences can help the next person, but it's, I was flying by the seat of my pants. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I did see that video where you talked about like putting in a Tinder profile, putting like terminal illness. Yeah. <laughs> Tinder five year relationship looking for. <laughs> I'm like, also like you want, you need to be able to squat like 130 pounds at any point in time. Cause when I fall, I need someone to pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, dating, dating is very tricky. I'm in a support group with a bunch of other women who were diagnosed before the age of 35. And it's interesting. Like a lot, a lot were married, some were newly married and then a good chunk are single too. And like some, I think are dating others are just not, um, just like sometimes it feels like a fun thing. Other times it feels like one more job to take on. I'm sure. So we're all over the place but I do love hearing the stories of the first dates. I would encourage you to think about the future, Brooke. Live like you're going to be around for 100 years. I'm betting you will make it. I hope so. I would love to see what I look like as like a, a wrinkly old lady. I've like done, there's a filter on TikTok that'll show you and I looked hideous. I'm like, I would love to meet that woman. Like she looked like a witch. Um but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think my brain just protects me in that sense about thinking about the future. I certainly don't think of it as like, you know, in a, in a bad way either, which helps, but like, I, I just don't really think about, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. And I actually never have, like, even when I didn't have ALS, I was never future oriented. Like I'd always date people. And my mom was like, do you think this is the one? And I'm like, I don't know. Like we're just having fun. Just relax. Like I've never been one to like have a plan. Whereas a lot of my friends, you know, were planning their weddings and all of that super early. I, I've just never thought about it like that. So maybe it would help to think about it a little bit. I don't know. You've got a slow progressing version and they are so close. Troy, please tell Brooke about Tackle ALS. Yeah, so. Um, I went to the website. I saw the website. You guys have raised cool. so much money. It's awesome. Yeah, we just, and it's about to be, uh, we're about to crack 8 million. We just got a, there's a really big, a really big donation came in. We, we did this thing with Steve Gleason. We called it like Rivals with the last ALS and Rivals being all caps. Mm -hmm. And it was the Saints versus the Falcons and the, the teams and the NFL helped raise money. And then the fans buy, bought like raffle tickets. And then the NFL matched it and the Falcons matched it and the New Orleans Saints owner matched it. So it's like, awesome. it's really cool. yeah, they raised over 300,000. Dad, I don't even know if you saw that yet. We just got that news, but it raised over 300,000 for Team Gleason, what Steve does, and 300,000 for tackling a loss. So the master platform trial basically makes it so you're testing multiple drugs at once rather than doing like one study and then waiting a year to find out the results you can do. So like we did uh, four or five in the first year. And the cool part about that now, what's, what's, make, what's different now is the first year, well, not first year, the first six years, seven years that my dad had uh, ALS, everything was about like, you're going to get worse, but can we slow down that slope? to yeah. make it instead of straight down can we make it a 45 degree angle and there's the you know medicines like radicava and stuff like that 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 did just that they did slow the slope down but now for the first time ever there's they're doing like repair and regeneration is the terms they're yeah. using which would be you know actually getting better that's the stuff where again knock on wood right and nothing's in the in labs, things have worked, but nothing's worked yet in testing. But the first three, like main, like the three big drugs for the non-genetic version for like sporadic ALS, people call it. Those first three drugs, one of them is in people now, and the next two, maybe two are in people now, and there's one more about to be. And those results, I mean, those will those will come out like this year. And if those work, I mean, any one of the three, or maybe it's a combination of all three. Like one of those could be, again, they won't, they won't say the term cure, but 
I will. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> you know, one of them. Well, we can, any, we can say whatever we want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any one of those three could end up being like the cure. And I said to my dad, like for mentality wise, let's not let's plan on it being like the third variation of it. Like somebody will take the first one and it won't work. And somebody will say, well, what if we tweaked this one little part? But the exciting part about tax, so what we do at Tackle ALS is we raise money. We don't charge any fees to the money we raise. We put it all into um, like promise drugs and promising, promising science, which originally meant drugs that slow down that, that um, slope. But now it, you know, it's trying to find something to actually get better. And, um, you know, ultimately, uh, something else that we do with the funds is we, we get people. I know you, you recently had actually a post on social media about this, but we get people who don't qualify for the trials. We get them in the trials. Yeah. And like the compassion use case. And so we, that's, that's where a good amount of money that we raise. Um, when we, when we help fund the, the trials, We'll also set aside money for that trial for compassion use cases where people who don't qualify um, can be on the can be on the uh, in the study. So okay, that's awesome. Eight million, you guys are beasts. We should think of a like some sort of event or some sort of something to do. I I tried doing this like five dollar challenge for my birthday where I asked everyone to donate five dollars to. And then I did like the Instagram fundraiser yeah. people like go wild for those because I think like the $5 thing takes some pressure off, you know? Cause like yeah. whenever people are like, go donate you, I always look at what other people donate and try to like go somewhere <laughs> yeah. in that range. I'm like, I don't want to be a jerk. Um, and so I just told everyone, I was like, do $5 and let's see what happens. And we raised like, it was like 25 grand on my wow. birthday. Um, but that was in December. So we should think of like, I don't know if it's like a holiday or like Tim's birthday or your birthday. Like we could just make he's, a fake reason to do a $5 challenge. He's December too, but we, we could do Which day? 16th. Um, 22nd. Close. Yeah. He, but we, we could do maybe like May, like. Ta- For like awareness. Month. Yeah. Yeah. That's so far away. We have to talk about merit. She is my angel. Merit is an angel. She's like the doctor that you don't, that you leave her office, like still with hope. Like I go to a, a, a clinic in Maryland and I have, I have to go in a week and I'm like, I'm dreading it because I feel like they take my data. Like they test me and then they send me on my way. And it's like, what am I getting out of this? Like all I'm hearing is just that I've gotten worse all over. Um, and so I hate going, but then like once a year I'll go see Merritt and I always feel like I've, I leave knowing that there's like a full pipeline of drugs waiting for us. Um, and they're so nice there. Her whole office is so nice. I never feel like depressed after I leave the way I do with some of my other doctors. Yeah, they're great. They're, they're, like you said, her, her, especially, but her whole team, they're all just amazing people. My favorite was they had me do an Instagram live with Merritt. Um, like the Rune platform did. Yeah. Are you two on Rune? No. Well, he might oh. be on it. On that You've got to get on there. Um, if go look at it and see if you're interested, and I'll introduce you to the team because it's an amazing, amazing resource. Like I wish it had started when I first got diagnosed. Uh, it's spelled R O O N. Um, but Merritt's on it. I'm on it. And they had us do an Instagram live and it was so funny watching Merritt navigate social media. <laughs> it's like, sh- like you see her in her element of neurology and she's like an absolute genius. And then we yeah. put her on Instagram live and people are commenting like, who's, who's the babe? Like she's hot. And Merritt's like, what's happening? Like, it was just all these trolls getting to and like, where did you get your glasses? I'm like, Mary, just ignore the comments. And she was, you could tell she was like, her brain was like over functioning. <laughs> I'm like, Mary, you just look at me. I'll take care of the comments. Oh, it was so funny. That is hilarious. Yeah. They're like, she's so hot. Who is this? I'm like, Mary, didn't you use yourself? You've got fans. Have you thought about getting a trach? Um, a little bit, not 
in depth, but that was the, the like you you haven't met the machine yet comment. I think that's sort of like where I am with all of that because I just don't know. I don't know yet. Like I think it depends on like the time in my life and how much support I still have at that point. And if I'm still having like a good quality of life, but I haven't really made any like hard and fast decisions yet. Not a planner. I told you I'm not a planner. <laughs> and luckily I have like friends and family that allow me to not have to plan too much. Like my siblings, my parents, they're like, move in anytime you've got a place here so i'm i'm lucky in that sense i didn't want to get a trach at first troy you saved my life yeah he, he originally didn't he originally didn't want to uh to get the trach and then when we were in the hospital um everybody left the room it was like him and i and i think my wife was there too and i said to him like you're so worried about like physically what you are, what you're not like, we don't need, no one cares anymore. Like you used your body, your body did everything you needed to do. It got you to the NFL and all that stuff. Like we just need your, your heart and your soul and your mind. And you have all that with, uh, with the trach. And I, I said, especially like at that time I had, my daughter was like three months old and I'm like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I need a lot yeah. of advice. I need a lot of advice and I don't know. I'm like, I, I still need parenting advice from you for like to help me. And now I need you to help me raise my kids. Yeah. You gotta watch that Mickey mouse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, we, uh, I don't know. I, I, I said this to you before. I, I think, especially with your voice, I, I think you should do it, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I have time to decide. I think yeah. my, so my sister, my, I'm so lucky. My sister's a doctor and my brother's like a wall street guy. So I have like the medical agent and the financial agent like built in for me. And I'm like, they'll, yeah. they'll make the right choices. Like I trust them. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a good support. That's a good supporting cast. Yeah. Brooke, just cause we're, we're so low yeah. on time. Um, our goal here is, well, first of all, we're gonna have to have, have you back on for a round two, but our goal is to have like really just interesting conversations with a whole wide range of people and all different kinds of backgrounds and, and uh, some ALS, some not all that good stuff. Is there somebody that you think that we should talk to that who's somebody that, you know, should have their story told or, or um, has a really interesting story that, that we could talk to. That's like the hardest question ever because <laughs> I find everyone's story so interesting. So like the bar might be really low for me. <laughs> oh, you know what? Actually the first person that comes to mind, um, there is a comedian who I've become like social media friends with named Aaron Belial. It's spelled A H R E N. I'll just type it. Cause it's like both of him his first name and last name are spelled not the way you'd expect it, yeah. but he has a uh, cerebral palsy and doesn't speak. So he does stand up comedy through his phone. Like he, he does, he types in the jokes and he huh. has his phone play them, but he does it on the fly. Like some of it is built in, but then he does a lot of like crowd work with his phone. Wow. It's amazing. Like, and he, he talks a lot about like mental health on his page too, because he obviously grew up, you know, with this disease, just like navigating childhood with it. But now he's a star and he's so, so funny. Um, That's awesome. I don't know why that was the first one to pop into mind, but like interesting stories. He's got a great one. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us today. I enjoyed it tremendously. Please stay in touch and let us know if we can ever help. Thank you so much. It was so great meeting both of you. And I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime you need someone to cry on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Brooke, thanks so much. Seriously, it's awesome having you. And I, it's, it's so interesting hearing your perspective, my dad's perspective, kind of same journey, but two different paths. So it's really cool to hear. Barkley. Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, 
nothing left unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.